Helen, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for being with us, with, with, with us today in this set of interviews. We are conducting with different persons and organizations all over the world about what the future of democracy is and what democracy really means beyond representativeness and how many discoveries of many uh, organizations and research are taking place right now about uh, this issue. Uh, Helen, to begin with, we want to know first, please Helen, tell us who are you and why is it that you have been interested and in researching in this topic of democracy beyond representative, uh, representativeness and beyond many other constructions of what democracy means today. Right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a political science um, a professor at uh, Yale University and I research democratic theory. I, uh, I wrote a first book in English called uh, Democratic Reason, Politics, Collective Intelligence and the Rule of the Many where I was using formal results in the social sciences to argue that democracy is a good regime in part because it taps the collective intelligence of the citizens. And building on that, I am now interested in looking at more empirical evidence for collective intelligence or what I call democratic reason. And so I've, I've looked into so-called democratic innovations, which are um, experiments and institutions to include um, the, the citizens in direct decision making, um, policy making, law making. And so that's how I came to be interested in certain experiments that have been conducted, for example, in Scandinavia. I've looked at the inclusive constitutional process in Iceland, the one that took place uh, in, uh, in Iceland from 2010 to 2013 and had this famous crowdsourcing moment where the constitutional council actually consulted the people online and posted their drafts to, be, to gather feedback from the people. And I've also been involved even more directly in, a, in an actual experiment in Finland where we, um, uh, uh, my co-author and I, uh, Tanya Etamoto from, from Finland and I, uh, were uh, trying to um, include the people of Finland in the, in the, in the revision of, a, in the reform of a, of a law on off-road traffic. Um, so that's also been one of the things that I've been, I've been doing lately. And I, I want to sort of start from this empirical observation of what's going on on the ground and elaborate um, a new concept that I call post-representative democracy, uh, by which I mean a new understanding of what democracy um, means in a, in a, for the 21st century, one that would include much more uh, direct uh, elements of uh, uh, participation by the people would retain some of the valuable feature of representative democracy and generally delegation because I think it, I think it's hard to return to a fully direct model of democracy I think it's it's actually neither totally feasible nor actually desirable and uh, and, and and also a model of democracy that would embrace the technologies that are now available to to make that model uh, work right so um, the internet to begin with Helen uh can you please tell us a bit more about your first uh, relevant work, Democratic Reason, Politics, right. Collective Intelligence and the Role of the Many? What was then your research question and what did you find in, in this endeavor? So my research question was uh, more or less the following. I, I always wondered why is it that we value democracy so much? Um, and the answer was, well, because we um, believe in political equality. But when you ask people, why do we value political equality, they never give you a clear answer. It seems to be based on a sort of faith, right? And um, in fact, looking at social scientific results uh, of the you know, recent past, I find that a good reason to care about political equality and therefore to care about democracy and democratic decision procedure is that actually giving each one of us a vote and more importantly, a say in a deliberative process actually ensures under the right conditions that we are going to get to the better answers um, to the problems that face us as a, as a group. And I think that's a really powerful reason to, to value democracy and to, to care about spreading it. Um, and it's a reason that should appeal to very skeptical people who don't really believe that we are all sort of equal and, and, and could embrace political equality at least, or a certain amount of rights for all of us on, on an equal level, for purely sort of pragmatic reasons. And uh, so that's sort of the, of, the, of the research question I had. And, and, and the answer is, is again this idea of inclusiveness as, um, as a guarantee of good 
performance of good uh, good solutions, good 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 politics, really, through the the key concept of cognitive diversity. Something I borrow from the work of uh, Lu Hong and Scott Page. Uh, they've shown. Uh, uh, that in order to make a group solve problems better, you're um, you're better off maximizing the difference in the way in the ways people think and address problems, and interpret the world, than maximizing the, the the ability, the individual ability of people of, of of the members of that group. And and I think this has has a radical implication for the way we think about politics, and in particular for the way we think about how we should select our leaders, our, our representatives specifically. Because I think our, our our thinking about that has been guided by the idea, the very Platonician idea, that we have to select the bright, the best and brightest, right? And so election is supposed to be a good device for that. It's a very, it's actually an aristocratic principle. But what happens is if you look at the uh, job approval of Congress, it's been oscillating between a low of 9% last November and a high of 33% sometime, you know, since the 1970s when these kind of polls were, were started to be made. So it means that never more than one third of the population approved of, of the job done by Congress. That's, that seems extremely worrying if those people are supposed to represent us. And yet when you ask people, when you poll uh, citizens about how they value the contribution of their individual representative, the numbers are much higher. So we, there's a complete discrepancy there. And in my view, this can be explained by the fact that it's not, in fact, a good idea to add up people that seem individually competent because it doesn't guarantee, these individual properties don't guarantee that you're going to have a collective uh, uh, group that is, that is performing the way you want it to perform. It's more important to take people that are not necessarily as you know, uh, smart or able individually, but make sure that the group itself has properties that are such that they think cognitively in, in diverse ways. They address the, the problems that they have to face from very um, unusual perspectives, and so they, they're more likely to solve the problem that way. And, and when, you, when you look at politics that way, when you look at the selection of representatives that way, it would tend to uh, suggest that we should move away from elections towards um, sortition in particular, or other forms of uh, selection for elites. So that's, that's sort of, the, if you want to summarize, like the core sort of contribution of my book, I would say, is there. And then there's other aspects of it where I, I, I just I, I look at the history of um, uh, arguments for democracy. I also point out the sort of strong anti-democratic prejudice that exists, I think, in the political science literature and in the history of political thought more generally. So I'm trying to fight back that um, elitist um, bias, I think, in our in our thinking about uh, politics. Uh, and then there is a concept which we find quite interesting. And I think here in Ecological Democracy we have listened about it before uh, by other researchers. And it is the concept of collective intelligence. How would you define this concept? And how uh, have you elaborated in this concept within your research? Yeah, okay, that's a very good question. So collective intelligence, I think it's it's a it's a concept that's been that's understood more and more. I would say in the last 50 years that there, there there's been a science of collective intelligence developing in the social sciences and in artificial intelligence in uh, uh, in all sorts of fields in cognitive sciences. And for me, it means uh, an emergent property that you observe at the level of groups, and that is a function of uh, both the individual intelligence of the members of a group and certain features of, of the group as a whole. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's the, you know, the ability of a group to solve problems, uh, make accurate predictions about the future, basically answer smartly to uh, unknown um, challenges. Uh, that's the intelligence part and the collective part is just about the fact that it's it's a it's a it's a quality that pertains to the group as opposed to individuals. Now, how it relates to democracy? Um, it doesn't relate directly to democracy. I mean, you could have um, oligarchies that are smart. You could have uh, um, dictatorships that are smart. Uh, the, the the collective doesn't mean that the group is necessarily inclusive. It just means that whatever the side of the group, you know, the 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 group is smart. Now, what I think. 
uh, connects collective intelligence to democracy, at least in my argument, is the fact that it's much easier, in my view, to maximize numbers, to include everyone, than to identify in the group, in any given group, who the smartest people are. Uh, it's, 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 it's not true in, in every field, for example, I suppose that for uh, brain surgery or uh, statistical problems, you can identify exactly who the smartest people are. You make them take a test or you make them study medicine or... But for politics, it's different because politics is a realm of questions where you can't know ahead of time what the challenges and the problems are going to be. They're going to go from, you know, uh, 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 environmental crisis to uh, violence to um, a drug issue to, to a health issue to, uh, you know, it, it, there's a range of problems that are that is so vast that you cannot identify exactly who competent people are going to be and I think the sum of knowledge required to address that sum of questions is too vast for any single mind or even for any uh, single subset of experts. So that's why in, in, a, in a political context, I think that you're better off in order to achieve collective intelligence, maximizing the inclusiveness of the process than trying to identify exactly uh, who the best and brightest are.